Hi, this is Alan Gassman, and I can't imagine being anywhere else at one o'clock on a Saturday afternoon than with my friends Ken, Elizabeth, and Chris. And we're going to talk about what you see behind me there on my screen crashing and burning. And in reality, what we're going to talk about is how to save business in bankruptcy or how to sell a business in bankruptcy. In many cases, the sale of the business is to a related party, but you need to set up a stalking horse, a valuation situation. You need to figure out what to do with books and records. You need to decide how to handle legal issues. This team that we have here, me excluded, has significant experience with what happens with an American business that has to go through the horrific experience of closing down or becoming bankrupt or using bankruptcy as a tool to reform debt. And, you know, we're getting through the COVID-19 crisis here. The government has printed a whole lot of money that's been keeping a whole lot of businesses alive beyond their normal life expectancy. So we think that this panel and those of you listening uh, in today are going to be very busy with the topic that we are discussing. Now, for those of you who are new to us, we are uh, the platform here. You can click on, on questions and then you can type in a question. I will see the questions. The other panelists may see the questions as well, or I'll read the questions. So we'd like to answer your questions in real time. The four of us will be presenting on this topic for the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants in Las Vegas the last week of, Ju of July. So you're welcome to join us if you viewed this, this webinar and you wanna join us in Vegas in July, explaining to your loved ones why you're leaving them to go to Vegas in July. I'll be glad to sneak you into this presentation so you can deduct your entire trip. But any CPAs and tax lawyers in the audience, <laughs> pretend that I didn't just say that. So, so let me uh, let me first introduce Ken DeGraw. Ken, I know very well. Ken and I are working to update our book on what CPAs and financial advisors need to know about bankruptcy. If you're attending this webinar today, I will give you a free PDF draft of the book if you will, number one, forgive grammatical errors, and number two, give us your input, be our beta testers. Ken has done a fantastic job expanding this book. Ken is a forensic certified public accountant, and he may be the most qualified forensic certified public accountant for bankruptcy in the United States. He comes very well recommended oh. professionally and as a presenter. So Ken, I'd like you to introduce Elizabeth and Chris and tell us just a little bit about why this panel was put together, the need for the knowledge here, and maybe a quick preview of what we're going to cover. I, I'm, I don't even know how to follow that up. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, those on the, the, the West Coast, good morning. Everybody else, uh, good afternoon. Um, the, the, the group here, as I mentioned, are going to be presenting at the Engage Conference for the SCPA in a couple of weeks. Um, and we thought this was a great chance to do a little bit of a test drive, uh, work out the kinks. Um, unfortunately, thank you for being our beta testers uh, so that we can uh, be a little more fluid in, in a couple of weeks when we're in front of a live audience, or hopefully a live audience, in a nice balmy, what will probably be 100 degree weather out there in Las Vegas. Should be fantastic. Show up in our swimsuits. Um, but we are joined today with uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Elizabeth Woodward, who I've worked with, an, on, with on a number of AICPA committees, um, specifically the Forensic Evaluation Services Group, which, which is the group that um, is, puts forth the standards for the profession. So in, in fact, I actually helped Elizabeth on a, another book project. I, I need to get some billable hours somewhere in here. Uh, PPC recently <laughs> redid their bankruptcy uh, publication and Elizabeth and I, uh, along with a, a, another attorney, got together and, and redid that. So I'm sure that'll be out shortly. Uh, Chris, I've had the pleasure of just meeting. 
Um, and his world is, is in valuation and business sales. And actually, why don't I turn the, uh, the mic over to the two of them and let them introduce themselves a little bit um, and, and, and their backgrounds. Okay, thank you, Ken. I'll go first if that's okay, Chris. Yes, um, this is Elizabeth Woodward. I'm hailing from Kentucky today. So good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I am a CPA, like Ken and I have the same credentials. I started my career as, a, as an auditor, but for the last 21 years, I have um, focused on working with companies in, that are in bankruptcy, considering filing bankruptcy, and then also in various stages of litigation outside of bankruptcy. So today, um, my role here is to kind of share some experiences as they're relevant uh, in selling businesses. So I, ha I have served as a fiduciary over the years. Currently, I am a subchapter five bankruptcy trustee. And so in and out of bankruptcy, I have been responsible for selling troubled um, assets. And so we'll share those experiences as relevant. So Chris? Yeah, so my name is Chris Lucas, uh, and I own the Lucas Valuation Group. I've been appraising businesses for in one capacity or another for close to 30 years now. Uh, Ten of, of those years uh, were actually spent uh, on Wall Street, where I was doing a lot of distressed debt investment, uh, and so that's kind of that's kind of my background. Um, I've got a pretty pretty significant amount of, of uh, you know, experiences in terms of in terms of uh, investing in you know, buying and selling distressed businesses uh, through the bankruptcy process. Great, great. So, Ken, where do we begin here? Uh, why don't we? Well, so what we're going to do here is we're going to follow the the table of contents that's part of the slide deck, which is uh, you can download uh, from the the the, uh, the link on the side. We're not going to flip slides here today. Um, unless there's something specific that we want to show. So we're just going to work right down this list and each of us have got little sections, so we'll, we'll take it from there. So let's start right at the top. Uh, what is it? So it's, uh, it, it's a bargain, right? It's, it's uh, a business or assets are on sale. You no, know, everybody loves a sale. Um, and in our particular context, we've got a business owner who typically has a need to raise cash pretty quickly. Um, and we have buyers out there that are looking for opportunities, looking for something on sale, looking for some synergy, looking for assets to make their business model stronger, more diverse, more geographically diverse. Um, that's what it is. Um, it's, it's really not much more. The, what comes after it is way more complicated, but understanding what a distressed sale is, is as simple as Macy's running its one day sale. They're just trying to, or, or the, the Amazon, um, I don't even know what it's called anymore, uh, uh, where everything is on sale and you're looking for a bargain. It, in the appraisal world, we call it a forced sale. The, the seller really just doesn't have a choice. Absolutely. So, so Chris, why, why, would, why would somebody Endeavor, and I mentioned it real briefly, but let's get into it a little bit more. What, why is this attractive? Why is why is this a route that a lot of people decide to go down? Well, I don't think anybody, you know, voluntarily decides to to go down this path. Um, when when someone when when a business is taken to market in a in a distressed transaction, uh, that means that the seller really doesn't have a lot of choices. Um, there are to, I mean, there's multiple ways that this can be addressed. I'll, here, I'll talk about two of them. One of them is is in a in a pre-bankruptcy sale or or a you know a, a transaction that happens without the benefit of bankruptcy court's oversight, and then there are sales that happen uh, with with the bankruptcy court oversight. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's generally it's going to be a bit more advantageous to a seller to sell before bankruptcy uh, because that way they are able to avoid the cost of going through the bankruptcy if ultimately the business is going to be sold regardless. Um, so so that's that has that's kind of the appeal to to a seller. Um, a distressed sale, a pre-bankruptcy distressed sale for the buyer. Um, is is attractive in that you know there's an opportunity to buy assets at a cheap price 
but there are probably more advantages to the buyer of actually doing the transaction and through through the bankruptcy process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, and we, we really don't have it baked into the slide deck at all, but uh, Elizabeth, your background, can you just take two minutes and just talk about the bankruptcy process that Chris alluded to, the, the 11, the sub five, the or a chapter seven and, you know, kind of just kind of paint the picture of that world and the context in which business sales happen? Sure, I can try to. Um, so, and it's interesting because sometimes you do have to go ahead and enter bankruptcy to sell a business and to buy time is often why that happens. So it's not uncommon, for example, that a foreclosure action occurs and um, someone will, a company will file bankruptcy to uh, stall that and then be able to sell the assets um, in the bankruptcy process. So sub five that Ken and I have both mentioned, that uh, is a provision or code that Congress created right before COVID. It became effective February of 2020. There are 250 bankruptcy trustees across the country, and it's designed um, to allow small businesses to get through a Chapter 11 process. So Chapter 11 means the company is going to reorganize and continue. It allows the company to get to go into bankruptcy and get out very quickly uh, with minimal fees. And there's a lot of detail. We could talk a whole hour about the details of that. Um, a Chapter 7 bankruptcy that Ken mentioned is that's a liquidation. So that's when things are being sold and the, and the business is not going to continue. Um, a, an expression we use about bankruptcy is once you're in bankruptcy, it's like an open kimono. Everything, there are no secrets. Um, you, nothing will get you in more trouble with a bankruptcy judge probably than to not be honest or to try to hide something. So as you can imagine, that has pros and cons in this process and you just need to be kind of mindful of them as you go. So did that hit the high points, Ken? I think that's got it. You know, and you know, I'll just okay. add in that you know, Chris mentioned the cost of bankruptcy, and and really that mm -hmm. mostly is in the Chapter 11 context, where the debtor typically has their attorney and their financial advisor, possibly an investment banker if they're going to look to sell their business. There'll be a creditors committee, and they've got a fun, uh, the same stack of professionals all being paid through the bankruptcy estate. So, aside from the time it takes to get through bankruptcy, which is another issue the cost of paying for all those professionals, you can imagine, is just astronomical. So if you can manage to get this and, done outside the bankruptcy process, all the better. Well, and also the um, U.S. trustee fees. So any disbursement yeah. that is made um, once bankruptcy is filed, a percentage has to be paid to the um, Department of Justice. So that's another advantage of the sub five um, bankruptcies. They don't pay those U.S. trustee fees. Um, I did want to say, though, when Chris was talking about selling businesses before bankruptcy or after, sometimes an advantage of the bankruptcy process is you can get out of certain leases. So, for example, if you're a retail operation with many different locations and some have, um, you know, leases that are too expensive, they don't work, you want to get out of those but keep other locations, you can use the bankruptcy process to do that. So if you're the buyer in that scenario, it might be better to be buying in bankruptcy because, you know, those things, you can only buy certain ones, the ones you want. Absolutely. And re regardless of the anti-assignment clauses in those leases, the bankruptcy court has a magic wand to just make that all go right. away. That's a fantastic point. Um, so some of the other reasons why, you know, people get into this and then decide to do it, you know, they're looking for some continuity of their business. They're they may have hit that um, a really rough patch and they're already starting to get strained relationships with customers and vendors and employees and, and everybody else that they're doing business with. If they can stay out of the bankruptcy process, um, they can try to preserve some of those relationships a little bit more um, in, in moving forward. Um, but there's clearly some reasons to avoid this like the plague. Um, Chris, what do you think? What are, what are some of the reasons people want to avoid this whole area oh well if you're if you're the business owner then obviously you want to keep your business um and you, you or you want to you want to sell it you want to sell it at at what what uh in the appraisal world we refer to as fair market value rather than at a forced sale price um, so so you know a, a big reason to avoid a distressed transaction whether pre-bankruptcy or post you know after filing uh, is is because there's there's a reasonable likelihood 
that the price will be will be somewhat diminished uh, from what it would be if the business were were operating uh, in in a uh, in a high performing manner. Um, so yeah, that's that's a reason to avoid you know interest stress. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And Alan, let's get the legal perspective in here. There's, I know there's a number of legal aspects to a potential sale either in or out of bankruptcy that buyers and sellers need to be aware of. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and one thing that comes to mind that I consider to be a big advantage of the bankruptcy court route is the fiduciary obligations of an officer and director of a company and their lawyers and accountants, because the duty in, in most of the states, if not all of them, is not to the shareholders, but to the creditors when you have an insolvent company. You have an insolvent company, while we may all be able to tell you all the things you can do to hurt your creditors and not pay your creditors, you have a fiduciary duty to the creditors. So unless you're operating under a court permitted arrangement where you're gonna follow a court ordered plan, be that a bankruptcy or be that what they call an assignment for the benefit of creditors proceeding, you wanna be very, very careful. And I want you to think about this business that you're representing or you're helping or you're lending to as a box and you're putting your hands in the box and it's full of rattlesnakes. Because we see clients get involved, whether they're lawyer friends of mine, or CPAs or business friends, owners, suppliers come in my office with a hand with a rattlesnake on it because they got involved and people get vicious. Also, one of one of my big mentors all told me I had never seen a, a recession before, you know, the first 10 years of my practice. He goes, You see all these nice people, you see how nice they are and they're wonderful and they're friendly. He says, wait for a recession. And then you'll see what they're really made of. And some of them will bite you. So you're dealing with that kind of environment and you, you want to be uh, you know, very careful. Chris, let me ask you something because I know from some of my friends are, on, are watching this webinar and people love to bargain hunt and they go to antique stores and they go to flea markets. Can somebody with good business acumen make a decent living buying stuff out of bankruptcy and selling it or buying businesses out of bankruptcy is that a myth or is that a reality no there, that that is definitely the case and there are times when it's easier to do that than than uh than, there, than it is at other times um you know, the the recession of 2001 to 2003 saw a tremendous number of corporate bankruptcies uh, and the, the the transactions in, uh, in with distressed business sales, you know, of significant companies, very you know, companies with half a billion dollars of revenue and more, um, was very active. You had a very active uh, contingent of distressed debt investors who were playing this game and making money hand over fist. You know, as the the economy improves, there are you know, the, there's there's slimmer pickings. Uh, and so, in, you know, in a in a robust economy or economic environment, you know, the companies that are that are seeking Chapter 11 or or seeking bankruptcy protection, you know, tend to be tend to be very weak companies. Really attractive bankruptcy companies or distressed companies are companies that have good businesses and bad balance sheets. Um, so, so, and those, those are businesses that are easy to restructure and make, make significant profits from. If it's just a bad business, then, you know, that may not be such an attractive buy. Yeah. It, how would somebody who's an experienced investor and business person find these opportunities? Would they, would they, how would they find the Ken DeGraw or the Elizabeth Woodland or the, or the Chris Lucas of their community? Where, where are those people? Who would you hire to be your so, bird dog? Uh, <clears throat> let's see. So to to be a bird dog, yeah, uh, a a freak of, Well, there's a couple ways to do it. Um, there there are reporting services that report companies that that are filing Chapter 11 um, or filing for bankruptcy protection. Um, if the company has publicly traded debt instruments, 
uh, then there are reporting services that will that will tell what their what their uh, how their debt's trading, uh, and you know, as the company as as a company begins to show signs of financial distress, its debt's going to trade at a significant discount from par value. Um, if it's got publicly traded shares, you could see a significant decrease in stock price. Uh, over over a period, and then and then you know decreased profitability uh, is is going to be another sign that that a company uh, is is needing to be watched carefully uh, as a distressed mm -hmm. investment opportunity. And then do you would you typically just uh, approach the business owner and say, hey, you're in bankruptcy. I'm an interested buyer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll let somebody else address that question. I, well, I'll I'll speak to that because I was going to say another. I agree with everything Chris said about how to find businesses. But if you ever see that a court has appointed a receiver, it's a red flag that something may be for sale soon. So when I have been appointed receiver, it's not uncommon or inappropriate for me to receive phone calls saying, you know, I'm so and so. If you're selling anything, please let me know. Okay. And the receiver typically wants to sell quickly. So would um, you know that is is probably happy to get that call. Yeah, okay. and that's, that's a great point too. Is that you know time is inevitable in a business in this environment. Um, time is the enemy. Uh, for every mm -hmm. week and day that continues to click by, value is continuing to be eroded, and they they need that that quick turnaround in order to preserve whatever value remains. Um, so if you, if you want to jump on those phone calls. Um, let's, let's jump forward to uh, Chris. You've been involved in, in a number of, of these types of sales. If, if I'm a buyer and I've got a target that I'm looking at, where, how do I begin evaluating this potential acquisition? That's a that's a great question. Um, and you know, the single most important thing that that a buyer needs to do is get its arms around. Uh, what the normalized cash flow of the business is like, likely to look like um, once the business is through. In this case, I'm kind of thinking about the restructuring process of the Chapter 11. Um, but but really, just once it's once it's through the period of of financial stress, as Elizabeth mentioned earlier, you know, one of the things that can be accomplished in the course uh, or through a bankruptcy proceeding. Um, is rejection of leases, um, and so and so a business that you know, so let's say a, a retail operator, a retail you know, business, um, may have stores that are well performing in its fleet of in, you know, in its in its uh, group of stores, uh, and then it may have others that are very poorly performing. The Chapter 11 process is an opportunity to reject a lot of underperforming stores. Uh, the leases on those stores, uh, and through that process, the business's ability to generate cash flow once it's restructured, once the economy improves, you know, then this is this is the the, the basis for for where you want to focus on on what the business is likely to be worth at some point in time. It's kind of it's your basis for what the intrinsic value of the organization is. And then once you've got a sense for what the intrinsic value of the business is, then, then you can kind of start to feel, figure out where in the capital structure there is value to be, to be acquired um, through, through different types of investments. Let, let, me, let me ask you a question that I should know the answer to, but I don't. If you have a 20-year lease, the tenant files bankruptcy, gets out of the lease, the damages are the, are the damages owed to the landlord that becomes a, a a claim? Is that limited to a year? Because I know can't a court reduce the the, the length of a lease to a year or something like that? And I, I believe there's also something for employment agreements that works the same way, if I'm not mistaken. Anybody with, know that? With rejection claims, so in a in a bankruptcy, the the debtor's got 120 days with a with a 90 day potential extension to accept or reject its leases. Um, if it rejects them, then the landlord has a rejection claim, which is an unsecured claim, um, which is either one year or 15% of the remaining rents 
and I believe capped at three years, if I have that right. Wow. I may be mistaken, but on a 20 year lease, it is going to be brought way back. Um, and then, of course, they're an unsecured creditor, so they're getting thrown into the bucket with everybody. Um, it's only the um, post petition rents that uh, get an administrative claim. And that's a good reason to negotiate like heck to limit guarantee liability if you can so that you don't get sucked up into a 20 year lease. As the, as the guarantor, it's better to put up a big deposit or at least get the guarantee reduced. Fight like dogs to get that done in case that client ever has to go bankrupt with a, with a long-term lease. That's really interesting. Absolutely. So Chris, when we're looking at um, the, the valuation process of these entities, I know we're gonna talk a little bit more about asset and stock sales in a little bit, but um, we, we, we know the typical three approaches to valuation. I will assume everybody's kind of got that core knowledge. Are there any unique twists, considerations that you, know, you need to be thinking about when you're building these models, um, when you're looking at a distressed company versus the, the garden variety company? I can imagine doing a market analysis has got to be tough if you've got a distressed company and a viable company uh, that's apples and oranges. Right. And so, and so uh, the answer, are there twists? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, so, so you know, think about a business that has multiple segments to it. There's you know, multiple businesses within the larger consolidated entity. You know, in, in the event that a, a company's got two businesses, um, you know, where one is generating a hundred million dollars uh, or $200 million of of uh, operating cash flow, and the other one is bleeding $100 million of operating cash flow, the consolidated valuation of those two businesses is going to, or consolidated cash flow of the two businesses is going to be the net $100 million. And if you apply a six times multiple to, to that $100 million net cash flow, the consolidated net cash flow, then you're going to come up with a value of $600 million. Um, but really the value of the business is going to be the $200 million good business at a market multiple, in this case, six times. Um, and so, and so the value would be a million two or a billion two, um, less the cost of potentially shutting down the business that is not performing in the event that it's not expected to recover. Uh, and so, and so all of these, and all of that comes back to this process of coming up with what is normalized cash flow of the reorganized business. And then there are all sorts of other adjustments that need to be made, you know, as management is, is writing off fixed costs and spending money to buy down leases, spending money to, uh, for severance. Uh, for employees, so there's a lot of there's a lot of noise that is in the cash flow numbers that are reported in the financial statements that need to be carefully thought through to determine what is the normalized cash flow of the business, so that you can come up with a good number on which to base your valuation. Gotcha. And then some of I meant to ask you before, but the, we you were talking before about the um, the time to get the company back to profitability is and this is you're probably going to tell me it depends but um is, is there a typical, <laughs> typical window of time that uh people look at but you know when they're evaluating an opportunity is it you know are they looking for a recovery within three years five years eight years um or does it I just think, it depends i i think the, i think that's a good, a good question I think it really kind of depends on whether or not there's visibility on what's going to cause that business to recover. So, so you know, in the event that that you've got a business that has super depressed cash flows because of COVID, uh, then then you know, there's if the business has the liquidity to get through the COVID crisis, then reasonably we might expect that that business is going to its its revenues and profits will recover once we come through this period of, of health related distancing. Um, you know, it, it, the same thing can be said for, for a, a, uh, a recession. 
Um, it's just, it's all, it's, it's not, in, if, from my perspective, it's less about a specific period of time and more about, um, more about the visibility of an event that would cause the business to recover. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's change gears a little bit and we'll give Chris a little rest here. Um, let's, let's jump to fraudulent transfer actions and what that's all about. And I, I'll let Alan chime in in a second. This is mostly a legal issue, but the, the, the concept here is that if a business is sold typically outside a bankruptcy process, and we'll get to why it, it's different in a bankruptcy process in a second, there's a potential that the creditors can come back and say that that transaction was fraudulent. Um, and try and either unwind it or claim damages. Um, Alan, give us a little more color around that. Well, the buyer, if the buyer gets a great deal and buys the business for not much, and the court can be shown that the primary purpose of that transaction was to move the assets out of the hands of creditors who would have otherwise gotten the business, then the cause of action extends to the buyer as the transferee of a fraudulent transfer. Now, if the buyer is not at all related to the seller whatsoever, and there's no continuing relationship after the transaction, I think that it's hard to have much to show against the buyer, at least in Florida. But people will make allegations and you know, I've I've had clients arrested after people made allegations that the clients gave them cash and envelopes. The FBI came to a client's office and arrested him in his waiting room when somebody testified to get out of jail that they were giving money, cash to him. So you're just much safer having this sale approved by a state court or by the bankruptcy court after notice to all of these creditors and especially if you had a relationship with the with the seller before the bankruptcy and you enjoy the relationship with the seller after the bankruptcy you're you know you may be a dolphin stuck in the tuna net yeah we're, we're, I'm, elizabeth i'm sure you've got some more stories here of uh, some of the more creative ways people have gone about well, this I, I do, but Alan said earlier um, something that was really important is this whole concept of zone of insolvency. And if if you are buying an asset that is not in bankruptcy, but if that company is in the zone of insolvency, which means its liabilities exceed its asset, everything has to be done for the benefit of the creditors. And so as Alan said, you could do, you could be completely on the up and up buying that business and a judge may ultimately decide you're on the up and up, but you're still gonna have to go through defending yourself, which can be extremely expensive and not very much fun. Um, and so I think, I know in a little bit, I'm gonna talk about finding advisors. I think any deals that are being done with distressed assets I would think a bankruptcy attorney you might want on your team, whether the whether you're the buyer, seller, whatever, but that bankruptcy attorney is going to be aware of these key concepts um, that that will protect you. Because in, in chapter eleven, and you know, Ken mentioned earlier creditors committee, if if, if a committee is formed, one of their big jobs is to pursue litigation. And um, and it can just get really time consuming and expensive. Yeah, and they definitely look under the hood of all this stuff, and they've got financial advisors like you and me that that start chasing all this stuff down. Um, mm -hmm. And there, are, as a financial advisor looking at these transactions, we we can go one of two routes. One of which is tougher, which is the actual fraud, and that involves identifying the badges of fraud. And um, obviously, that goes to intent, and that's always a challenge. The alternative there is, you know, what's known as constructive fraud, where you you've got a transaction where the allegation is that it was exchanged for less than reasonably equivalent value, which of course isn't defined anywhere. So you've got to um, come up with all of your metrics. And then as Elizabeth mentioned, it's, they, they need to have been insolvent at the time. Um, and there's a number of ways to prove insolvency. 
one of which is liabilities exceed assets, as Elizabeth indicated, and that, that's known as the balance sheet test. There is an inability to meet obligations as they come due, and it's much more forward-looking. Typically, there's secure debt and, and other layers of, of debt on a company's books. And then the third one is insufficient capital, where you're looking at a business, which it's technically a precursor to insolvency, where you're looking to see if they have the, the capital or can obtain the capital, either through lines of credit or equity infusions, to sustain operations through normal business cycle. Um, and all of that involves expert witnesses like myself and Elizabeth and probably Chris as well at times when he's looking at valuations to come in and, and opine on all this stuff. And you don't want to find yourself in that world. It's just ugly. Um, so, and we'll get into why using the bankruptcy court in, in a couple of minutes here. But let's talk about some signs. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Alan. Let, let me ask, let me ask, I got, I've got some questions that have come in. So I probably think cool. some of them. The first question is why would a valuation report be needed? The questioner says, um, if the business is either going to be shut down and liquidated or sold to the highest bidder, isn't that the evidence of value or does the court require a valuation report and expert? Who can answer that? Uh, I can start and then Ken can fill in everything I forget maybe. Um, as far as I know, well, we start with it depends like we always do. Um, you know, I think if, if uh, I don't know that you would definitely need a report. Um, you're right. If you're having, if you're in an auction setting or a public sale where multiple bids are going to be received, then yes, generally it's probably the case that that is perceived as arm's length and the market value. Um, Ken, do you have any other comments about why you would want to report? In, in in that particular scenario, I think I agree. Maybe a report isn't necessary, but what comes to mind is. Um, Typically, there's a debt underlying the business, and an under, the business owner may want to understand the potential proceeds from that sale um, in order to negotiate with their creditors to, uh, for the haircut, rather than trying to sell up front and saying, all right, here's the $1.98 I have left, um, here's what you can have. Uh, you, you you need that to negotiation, particularly with the secured lenders up front, because typically all this stuff is collateralized anyway. Um, so that that may be the where you at least need an indication of value. You may not need a full blown valuation report. Right. Usually the valuation is coming into play when the business is not going to be sold, but re reorganized uh, so that existing stakeholders are going to have different pieces of the pie. Uh, and and so there's not there's not a a arm's length transaction that takes place that establishes value. Okay, no, that's good. Another question: um, the, the the questioner is a doctor facing a malpractice action that may not settle within limits of liability and may have a horrendous judgment against his practice. So he's been told that. The worst case scenario is he files personal bankruptcy, loses nothing under Florida law because of the way his assets are, but then that he or some, somebody will have to buy his practice back out of bankruptcy. The practice has a phone number and a website and a bunch of patient charts and some computers that might be worth 75 to 100,000. He has no non-compete or employment agreement with the practice. But he's told that the worst case scenario is he'll have to put it into bankruptcy to buy it to get a judge's to judge to bless that. So how do you explain that process to the client and what should the client expect to pay for that type of process, assuming that the personal injury lawyer is not so friendly and you know challenges the process? Well, I think if they get into a, the personal bankruptcy. The, well, it, and, and it's typically going to be, I would imagine, a chapter seven. I guess conceivably it could be a chapter 13. Um, there's going to be, if in a seven environment, and Elizabeth, you may be able to speak this better, um, a negotiation with the trustee, typically for what that value is going to be um, versus an auction sale in a public uh, in, in environment. In a 13, there's going to be a plan uh, to put 
X amount of value back in and the judge is going to bless that. I don't have any experience with a professional services firm. Um, yeah, I'm, sorry. Saying, I'm de dealing with a, a, it sounds like a case I'm dealing with right now, but it's, and, and we've got to have to have the, the doctor himself is a little bit of a bad actor. Um, so it's presenting different challenges, but it's the same scenario where it's right now it's at an 11. Uh, the theory is it's going to flip to a seven and um, he'll need to buy those businesses out, but you may need some valuation reports on those. There may, you know, physician practices with single owners, there are some databases out there of sales. Um, but when you've got an individual owner and in, they're effectively the goodwill, um, they are the practice without them. Uh, is there, is, and Chris, maybe you can even comment, is, if, to what extent is there even value here? Uh, medical firms, medical franchises can be can be sold. It kind of it depends on on the nature of the practice. So if you've really if you've really got it arranged so that the doctor is the business, the the, the person is the business, then it does it can become quite challenging to to actually sell that. Okay, here's another question. The Employee retention credit is often overlooked. If unclaimed by the seller, can you describe what's at play? Can the purchaser take the ERC after the sale if it wasn't accounted for in the sale? That's a good question, Nick, and it's not addressed in anything I've written about ERC. So, <laughs> that? I would think if it's a continuing entity, it, it's an asset of the entity if you buy the entity, but not if you buy the assets. That may be a place for people to hide. I guess you have to put that as an asset, my ability to get an ERC credit. Okay, then Eileen had a question. After secured lenders, do creditors take priority over deferred salaries or do payroll issues take priority even if not secured? Would IRS debt supersede those payroll claims regardless? Well, Eileen, you need to read our PDF book. <laughs> where I knew those answers when I wrote them. <laughs> you, but I'm sure Kim knows those answers right now. Oh, uh, thank you, Alan. Um, <laughs> there, there are prior, there are priorities in the bankruptcy code for unsecured creditors, um, and there's it's a on, on who gets paid first. There is a limited priority for wages. I believe it's ten thousand um, uh, dollars, along with um, for other things like deposits and certain employee benefits, but. Um, yeah, it's at, read the book. It's, it's great reading. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's, here's another question I have. How do the panel members work with the emotional challenges of business owners who are losing their baby, losing their business, and have significant blinders on? They come to us too late. They come to us upset. How, how do you turn that around? What's the pep talk or what's the, and some of them come to us with greatly dishonesty, great dis, great plans of dishonesty. It's, it's a unique client that most of us quite candidly are not used to having. So how, how do you, when you mentor a young professional in this, in, in this business of representing debtors who are scared, illogical, upset, maybe dishonest, what, what are the rules of the road for you guys? I'll start with that because interestingly, I think it's the human component that has drawn me to bankruptcy over the years. The first case I worked was a, it was a retailer started by an entrepreneur, you know, one man with a dream. And um, it is a low point in someone's life. Um, and, and depending on how that life goes, maybe the ultimate low point when this business that they have started is failing. Um, now, as far as the dishonesty, I don't have much patience with that. I can't, I mean, I don't like to be in that zone. Um, so, um, but I think, and, and in terms of um, advising younger professionals, the reality is this work is not usually done by younger professionals. It's done by more senior professionals. Um, but I guess I would say, 
you either like it or you don't. A, a lot of CPAs, and Alan, I don't mean to upset you here, but a lot of CPAs, in fact, do not like working with attorneys. And being in court makes them very nervous. And so if that's, you know, the way someone is, then they just shouldn't walk down this road. Um, but I think one thing that I always try to keep front of mind, I mean, one, you know, you're just a person and, and, and I, I try to be human about it. I charge by the hour. And so it's not really in the debtor's best interest to sit and go on and on and on with me because the meter's ticking. So I do try to limit it. Um, so I guess I would try, I try to be compassionate and sensitive, but limit it and keep it to business. You know, one thing, when a business fails, the owners or the people involved are very often embarrassed. And so to the extent that we all work in this world all the time, I think just being around us can be comfortable because they realize when they come to our office, they're not the first person we've ever dealt with like this. We deal with this all the time and all of our clients are smart and it still happened to them. And so I think that gets it on a playing field where they might be more comfortable talking with us than they have been with others. What do you think about that, Ken? I, I agree with that. Um, and there's, there's I, I, actually, I enjoy talking with um, my, some of my partners who deal with matrimonial actions and there's a lot of similarities because you, you've got you know, clients going through a marital breakup and a business breakup, especially if it's multi-generational businesses, it's even tougher. Um, where I've, and I've unfortunately spoken with some of them that know, well, we're gonna figure this out. And the reality is it's, they're not. Uh, but where I've got, had some wins is finding out who they listen to. Um, if it's that, senior business owner, maybe it's a, uh, a, a younger child or a, a relationship or a trusted attorney relationship sometimes that they've had for years and they're willing to listen to that advice instead of just us coming in cold. And, and, and Elizabeth, you're 100% right. You know, the, the folks that I talk to on a regular basis, um, the, the, the fact that we can offer answers and give them some insight into what this process is about and what's likely to come next and kind of play shepherd through the process mm -hmm. uh, really seems to put people at ease or at the extent they can. It is stressful. There's no doubt about it. And then the transparency that comes with a bankruptcy process is completely, un they're always un completely unprepared for, especially a private business that's never had to uh, open their books and records to anybody before. Um, suddenly everything is exposed to the, the, the kimono that you were talking about earlier. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's a tough transition. Um, I, I think another thing that I do, Alan, if I'm helping clients, if I'm in a position to be recommending other advisors like an attorney, um, I tend to select people who are cooperative in nature and who don't churn just for the sake of churning. Uh, because not only is it expensive, um, but it can make the, the process more upsetting, I think, than it needs to be. Yeah, I hand out a lot of copies of the book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie. And he's got a great chapter that just basically says, you know what? Figure out the worst case scenario. Decide you can live with that. You can't learn how you're going to live with that worst case scenario. Figure out how you're going to improve your odds and then get, to bu get busy and get that done. Mm -hmm. I find so many clients come to come to us with good advisors, but without the plan. You know, they don't have the marching orders. They don't have the plan. So just, okay, what what's the worst case scenario? All right, yeah, you may lose the business. You're not going to lose your home. You can earn a living. You're not going to go starving. You've still got all that money in your IRA and your pension account. Yeah, you'll be embarrassed, but guess what? Every Every one of my clients that's gone bankrupt has recovered. Bankruptcy ends. Marriages end, life goes on. Here's the nine things I need you to do this week. That's, I think that's a much better approach. Let me go to another question, and I can ask this question because I'm a lawyer. How do, you, how do you get the clients to the good lawyers and not the crappy ones? You know, because in the bankruptcy arena, almost anybody can be a bankruptcy lawyer and do a bunch of easy chapter sevens and you know, that stuff. And you see these chapter seven mills, but then every once in a while, one of those lawyers gets a big chapter 11 and just 
from what I can tell, messes it all up. So what do, what are your thoughts on that? I, I tell you what, when I, aside from the friends that I have that are bankruptcy attorneys and I even, you know, they're, they're my default to, to go to. Um, if I have a bankruptcy out of state and I'm up here in New Jersey, uh, so usually New York, New Jersey, I got a pretty good handle on, but if something's happening in Kentucky, I can call Elizabeth. Um, but otherwise, in every state, uh, and Elizabeth mentioned it earlier, there are Chapter 7 panel trustees. These are the folks that handle the Chapter 7 cases and are appointed on a, on a regular basis. They do bankruptcy all the time. Now, they're making $60 a case, unless there's assets in that case. They're not retiring on that. So they have private practices. Um, if that's the list I inevitably start with, um, it's a, and it's, it's published, it's on the Department of Justice website, uh, and you can look up who the panel trustees are in every state, both Chapter 7 and Subchapter 5, and that would be my go-to if I'm, I'm going to another state. But, yeah, I, I don't know, Alan, if I've ever had a situation like you mentioned. I mean, I will tell you for my part, I'm careful about the attorneys I work with because, you know, if I'm in bankruptcy court to some degree, debtors counsel is is working with me even though they don't technically represent me um i i i don't know that i would ever advise a client to fire an attorney that just doesn't feel like something i would do i might approach it by saying you know you have this situation and i know this person who i think is really good in that maybe they could help your attorney so maybe get someone else on the team um is how i would probably approach that yeah, let me let, let, let me ask you another thing, which I think, you know, we should cover for sure on the legal end, but tell me how it normally works, is uh, to, to have the attorney-client privilege, you have to work with a law firm, and there's no CPA client privilege under the federal law, and therefore in the bankruptcy court. So at what point do you say, oh, I'd love to help you, but you have to have your attorney hire me? Do you do that before the first phone call or before the first meeting or at what point do you do that or or do you not need to do that uh, I mean, so it depends yeah <laughs> um yeah i don't know can you want to start and then i'll i'll share sure sure i mean it's, it's, you, you, the, the the short answer is you want to do that as early as possible um and get that cold bell letter in place um because you're right there is no a, a accountant client privilege now if it's a bankruptcy action that there's really no need for it because it's all out there. Um, if this is a private environment, you know, th then you've got to, it, and where the need is probably going to come in is, and, and Chris alluded to a little bit, you know, wh what are the warts here? Um, you know, what are the skeletons that are in the closet that we need to be careful of? And usually there's some tax issues that are working in the background. Uh, or some other stuff that might have happened that where we need to get that legal protection and representation. Okay. All right. Speaking of taxes, this is from Fred. One caution from an income tax perspective. If the business owner sells a bunch of assets and then goes into bankruptcy, business tax savings carryovers like NOLs and business credits transfer to the bankruptcy estate with the business owner left holding the bag on the income taxes. There's an election that can be made to allow the business owner to file split year return in the year the bankruptcy begins so they can use their tax savings carryovers. This happens before they transfer the bankruptcy estate. Fred, can you come explain that in Las Vegas the last week or two? <laughs> <laughs> What, what Fred's referring to, and this is unique to individual bankruptcies, this is not business bankruptcies, is there's a short year election that can be made um, to file a separate 1040 immediately before the filing of the bankruptcy. And then the banker, when a, an individual files for bankruptcy, a separate bankruptcy estate is created uh, and it pays its own taxes separate and distinct from the individual. So. And he's 100% right that any tax attributes of the individual that may exist at the time the bankruptcy is filed transferred over to the bankruptcy estate. Um, so to the extent you can take advantage of them in that stub period, then all the better, and then transfer any residual over to the bankruptcy estate. So that's, that's the short version of the short year election. 
Okay, great. Well, that's all the questions so far. They were starting to get tough. It's a good thing. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, why don't we jump ahead here a little bit? Um, as we suspected, we were going to run a little short on time and jump up to. Uh, we'll get Chris back in the picture here. Start talking about some deal structuring and the asset versus stock sales, uh, loan to own, those kind of topics. Okay. So, so moving straight to the the asset and stock sale differentials. In in an asset sale. Um, the uh, the bankruptcy estate or the owner will retain uh, the liability to to uh, responsibility for all of the the, the uh, financial obligations of the business that's sold. Uh, in a stock sale, uh, the buyer is actually assuming all of those liabilities. Uh, and in a circumstance where, especially when businesses get into financial distress. Um, sometimes the reporting standards can, you know, the reporting starts to slip. Um, they lose track of liabilities, um, and and so and so there it starts to become much more risky to buy a business in a stock sale um, if it is experiencing financial distress than it is to buy it uh, in an asset sale, um, where the where the uh, the seller is going to retain responsibility for paying the liabilities. Um, and then, and then, um, what else do I want to say? So, drop it down to loan to own. Um, this is this is a game that is that is a favorite of distressed debt investors. Uh, it is also a favorite. You know, there's there are private equity firms um, that also uh, participate in this. But essentially, the loan to own game is is identifying. Um, what the, the value of the company's assets are and how far through its cap structure, its pre-petition cap structure, um, the, the, uh, the, the, debt, the debt of the company is supported by its asset value. Uh, and, and this becomes, so, so in, a, in a loan to own circumstance, the business is not sold, but rather it's pre-petition debt uh, winds up being either reinstated or converted into reorganized equity uh, in the event that you are buying the what, what we refer to as the fulcrum security. Um, that's the instrument that will be converted into post-petition equity, uh, and and be, and that can be a really really attractive way to get control of the business. Um, a lot of times, or, you know, there there are other ways to to do this. Um, through through actual direct lending um, that that comes with with pre-negotiated rights uh, to to create ownership in the event that there's a default on uh, on on this this uh, distressed loan that is made to the business. Fantastic. How about uh, earnouts and indemnifications? I know those are obviously pretty typical in a in a standard business deal. Is there a, a a unique approach to these in a distressed environment? That's a good question. Um, in an earnout, I, I can't say that I've seen a distressed transaction that involved an earnout. Uh, have you? Have you seen that? <laughs> no, I haven't. That's why I figured I'd ask it. Like, um, like, yeah. Where did that question come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it, the, I guess the thought process would be is, you know, if you're going to retain the existing ownership in some role, um, and it, it's a way to get the deal done, perhaps you, you build in something yeah. for them to keep their interest um, and maybe help them you know, catch a piece of the upside, assuming they're able to actually help the business get right-sized and, and continue to flourish or flourish again. I should yeah, say. And, and that would be that would be probably more common in smaller bankruptcy sales. I have a little less experience in, in smaller transactions, um, but he, I mean, certainly there'd be a way to structure that in. It, it helps save face. I've been, I've had these, and it helps save face for the owner to say, "Yeah, I lost the business, but if it does really, really well, I've got a consulting agreement, and I'm going to be able to, you know, 
even if it's complete pie in the sky, there's a psychological aspect and a social aspect that, and, and, you know, you want the blessing of the old owner because some of the, uh, some of the customers and some of the suppliers are going to be loyal to the old owner. So in the smaller transactions, we've seen those and they can be good. They can be productive and important. Cool. Um, so let's, let's talk about a couple of the risks and Alan, let's throw this one to you. So there's, what's this concept of successor liability? Well, yeah, a lot of, especially doctors, because I do a lot of creditor protection work for doctors here in Florida, come to me and say, well, I'm not worried because I'll just, you know, I'll just set up a new practice. I'll close the practice down. I'll set up a new practice. And then, you know, the creditor can't get anything. Well, there's a common law uh, successor uh, liability doctrine. It comes from the English common law back 1776. You can't just close down a business that has a judgment against it and open a new one with the same customers, the same location, the same employees, you know, and that liability follows under state law. And at least in Florida, if you do a court supervised assignment for the benefit of creditors, that liability still follows, in my opinion, because the Florida statute does nothing to abrogate it. So the only thing you can do to abrogate that is the Section 363 sale, where under Section 363 of the U.S. Bankruptcy Code, the judge sprinkles the pixie dust, and that stops the doctrine of successor liability. Fantastic. Um, yeah, we'll get to that pixie dust in just a second. Here's the 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 other ones. Uh, the, actually, we talked about fraudulent transfers, um, and th there are two other issues that tend to pop up. One is bulk transfer laws. Some of the states have um, rules built around the, the uh, sale of substantially all the assets requiring some reporting, um, and then finally, just unpaid taxes. Uh, or potentially taxes required requiring to be withheld on sale for, for instance, non-resident partners. So you, you need to be alert for both of those or all of these issues when you're entering into this environment. Uh, some of the stuff can kind of whip soy you. So having that experienced advisors uh, along the way with you here is definitely going to pay you some dividends uh, in making sure that you don't step on any landmines. Yeah, and just so the laymen who are watching this program know, you can save a lot of income taxes when you reduce debt in bankruptcy under some very complicated rules that would take much more than 75 minutes to explain. And you can also avoid documentary stamp tax and transfer taxes in most states by making your transfers or your deed in lieu of foreclosure or having your foreclosure sale in bankruptcy. And that, that can offset all the, all the cost of bankruptcy. And, and many more. So sometimes we do what's called a pre-packaged chapter 11, which is we don't need to go bankrupt except to save taxes. So we're gonna do this debt reduction deal and this transfer of real estate under the chapter 11 bankruptcy. And then that's that's a very, very friendly and methodical uh, type of arrangement. Absolutely. All right, so we, Alan mentioned 363 sales and the magic pixie dust. So we're going to dive into that for the next couple of minutes here. Um, 363 refers to the section of the bankruptcy code that provides for the sales of assets in a bankruptcy situation. Um, typically, it can either be done either as part of the plan of reorganization or separate uh, from the plan as just part of the, uh, the process and get the judge's permission to, to sell assets outside the ordinary course. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the, the reason to do a, a 363 sale or a sale in bankruptcy is because value is deteriorating really quick here. And we want to have that sale of assets to a potential buyer as quick as we can to maximize not only the, the amount of cash flow, but if we've got a going concern business, we want to preserve whatever remains of that going concern so that a potential buyer can pick it up and run with that ball, all the warts um, and all. Um, the beauty of a 363 sale 
Uh, and the, the main reason to do it, well, let me back up a second here. So what happens with a 363 sale, and we'll, we'll talk about the parts in a second, is typically a stalking horse is identified, which is a potential buyer. Talk about that in a second. Um, the stalking horse then provides that initial bid, which is going to be brought to the bankruptcy court. And within the context of the bankruptcy court, then there's literally going to be an auction held in court. Uh, where other potential buyers can come in and make offers on the on the business or the assets as the case may be uh, and it goes to the highest and best offer and best does not necessarily mean highest there are all kinds of sweeteners that can be involved uh, something called credit bidding uh, and other things can come into play in a 363 sale to make one offer more attractive than another uh, which is way beyond the, the, the topic for today but the, the absolute biggest advantage, um, then I'll let maybe a little Elizabeth chime in here for a little bit, is a, once that the judge slams his gavel down, that transfer of assets or that business takes place free and clear of all liens. So with, with that single stroke of the gavel, all of the, the bad things, that potentially could come along with a sale outside the bankruptcy process magically go away. Um, we've, we've got all that wonderful protection. Um, to, with, with that all said, uh, Elizabeth, Alan, uh, Chris, uh, anything else to add in there? Elizabeth, what are the practicalities of a 363 sale? Is there anything that an advisor or a client about to go, it sounds so easy. Is yeah. it as easy as it sounds? What's, what, what, what do I not know and what's the snake that can bite me? Well, um, the snake that can bite you could be the speed. These things do move very quickly. They need to move quickly. For those of you that have not worked in bankruptcy court, you know, typically judges are very responsive to emergency motions, et cetera. Um, these processes can work best when everyone involved kind of gets along. And so that's what we talked earlier about being careful about the attorneys you hire. You know, if you're working with someone who's an obstructionist and who is known as an obstructionist, the deal might not get done as smoothly. Um, also, we've said it, I guess we just can't say it enough. Everything in a 363 sale is, it, there are no side deals. Everything is open, transparent. Um, and so from our perspective for CPA, that's a CPA's dream, right? Because that's how we, that's where we live anyway. Uh, but any buyer should just, should just be aware of that. But I think what I have seen is exactly what Ken said, when there are liabilities or things that, that you need to get rid of, this is a very good way. And it's a, it's a very good way for a buyer to, to get a business in the right setting. Right. And you know, just, just quick ad you know, there there are a lot of investors who like to buy distressed assets that would really not consider buying the business pre-petition or without the benefit of a 363 sale so you're going to get more potential buyers and that has the potential to create more value to the bankruptcy mm -hmm. yeah i've had a couple of instances where in talking with a potential buyer the deal has been negotiated with the intention of once we've got all the, the, the deal worked out, the business is going to file for bankruptcy to get the magic pixie dust. Um, and just be sure that it can't, there's no fraudulent transfer coming back at us. There's no successor liability. None, there's no working creditor out there that hasn't been identified for whatever reason or just got forgotten about that's going to come back out of the woodwork and suddenly um, uh, throw a, a wrench in the entire deal. Um, the, the sale process itself is um, a little different from the, the typical in that you're going to avoid a lot of the, the typical reps and warranties that you're, you typically see just aren't going to be there. Uh, you're basically getting what it is, where it is, how it is. Uh, have a nice day. Um, the, as the deal is being negotiated, you want to be careful to limit the the ability of the, the potential seller to solicit other offers, because that's what this is all about at the end of the day. Certainly the stalking horse that's coming in 
is going to get some protections built around them uh, so that they are they have a number of advantages, including advanced due diligence that a lot of the buyers on a short time frame aren't going to have the ability to do, uh, or at least the amount of time. Uh, there's going to be bidding processes built around the stalking horse, including minimum bids and other protections so that all of the time, effort, and energy that they've put in doesn't go to waste, uh, including a potential um, breakup fee uh, will also exist. So let's see if there's anything else as we start running down time here. Um, some of the pros to a, st a stalking horse, uh, you know, they've got that guaranteed opportunity to make that bid um, and formulating the minimum parameters and putting the bidding procedures together. They're a part of that whole process. Um, I mentioned the more time for due diligence. The, 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 on the downside though, if, certainly you're dealing with bankruptcy court and as Elizabeth has, and we've all mentioned a couple of times, it's completely transparent. So stuff happens. Um, that's just kind of unanticipated. Murphy absolutely is uh, one of the other bidders that you will be running into uh, and things will not always go as expected. Um, and usually the folks coming into a bankruptcy process, uh, along with what Chris has been mentioning, are attuned to the process and know exactly what they're getting into here. Um, and just to kind of round out, and then we can jump to some other questions um, with some of the tax issues that are out there. The this is a, an entire seminar, but the the big one is cancellation of debt, um, and there's the the debtor here is looking to be relieved of obligations in some manner or form, and depending on the type of entity that's in play, uh, if it's a pass through. Uh, the, the different challenges are presented than if it's a straight up corporate entity. Um, in, in short, the, the way the section 108 of the Internal Revenue Code works is that if the debt is being forgiven, and that does, doesn't mean eliminated, it can simply be a change in the structure of the debt, interest rate, time frame, uh, can also cause a debt to be modified sufficient enough to for there to be consideration of cancellation of debt. If that happens, then the next layer of the onion is to determine whether or not that causes that cancellation or forgiveness to be taxable. Um, if it is taxable, there, is a, there are a number of exceptions under Section 108 that can be taken advantage of. And the two big ones are a bankruptcy exception uh, and an insolvency exception uh, for obviously companies that are not in bankruptcy that are still insolvent. And that's just assets minus liabilities. Um, in either instance, if the debt is not going to be includable as income, or the forgiveness is not includable, then certain tax attributes of the debtor need to be eliminated or reduced. Um, and that's probably about as deep into COD as we've got time to get into. Uh, the, the other one is the 382 limitations under the Internal Revenue Code, and that goes to uh, use of net operating losses on change of control. Uh, there are, is an exception built in there for bankruptcy um, where under certain circumstances, uh, the haircut that's typical in a 382, you would not have to take. But again, we're getting up against the clock, so I don't wanna get too deep into some of these crazy tax issues that could take the entire afternoon to try and explain. But I'm sure there's some questions out there, Alan. Yeah, and Ken and I have uh, done some video, some webinars on the tax issues, which if anybody wants to see one, just email me and we'll be glad to send you a link. And before I forget, you have everyone's email addresses here at the beginning of the PowerPoint. Um, please send me the easy questions and Elizabeth, Ken, and Chris, the more difficult ones. <laughs> Elizabeth, I'll get back with you. And, and please, if there's anything we've done or haven't done today that you like or don't like, let us know because we'll be doing this for uh, 60 minutes in Las Vegas. And uh, you know we wanna make the presentation as good as possible. Um, Elizabeth, you had a couple of stories to tell, I think. Oh. Uh, do you wanna share one? Well, uh, that's a big lob. I don't know that I, sh I should be able to knock that down. I don't know. Um, need some context or something to pick one, I guess. Well, 
What's the craziest thing you've seen? The craziest thing that I have seen. Um, I guess, well, some of the craziest things I can't really talk about <laughs> where it could be recorded or used back against me, I guess. Um, you know, I, I think it's just come to expect the unexpected, maybe after situations where on the eve of an auction, you know, a court approved auction, the debtor will, well, I had one case where I was selling assets outside of bankruptcy on um, the eve of the sale. The debtor filed bankruptcy, which, uh, you know, made me not be able to auction the assets the next day. We then proceeded to a two day emergency hearing in uh, bankruptcy court where those of you that have been in bankruptcy court will recognize this is very unusual. And this I was much younger in my career that here. This was about 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Maybe I was sitting on the stand in federal court. And the judge decided to let two attorneys tag team asking me questions. You know, normally just one attorney takes you. And I'll never forget because the attorney took his jacket off to ask me questions, which I also have never seen. And I'm sitting there saying, oh, no, here he comes. But anyway, after that two day hearing, the judge ruled that the, you know, this company was not allowed to file bankruptcy. The, the receiver order that we had agreed to took away that right and they were actually reporting to a state court judge here in Kentucky. Um, and then, and this is, it, I thought unusual. I don't know. I haven't seen it much here. I don't know. Maybe you all have. The judge actually ordered um, that law firm to disgorge their fees. So they had been paid a retainer by this company or by the, by a family member. It was actually by father-in-law. And they had to give all that money back after this two day emergency hearing because the court said, you know, you weren't allowed to do that. So um, that was certainly very interesting in terms of the process. Yeah. And that reminds me of another rattlesnake we'll want to make sure we mention, and that's the preferential transfer rules under the bankruptcy code, mm -hmm. which can be absolutely egregious. I mean, to, yeah, I need to file a bankruptcy in order to get this business sold and reduce these leases. But, oh, my gosh, I, I was a guarantor on that lease. Mm -hmm. So I got to get back the last 11 months rent because of those egregious rules. So that's interesting. All right. So mm -hmm. we covered this in 75 minutes, uh, known to many of the people on this webinar as 1.5 billable hours. And uh, <laughs> I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, Ken, Chris, Elizabeth, any Final words to the wise here. Uh, and I want to mention we had uh, 64 attendees. We started with 64 and we have 64. So I think that they all fell asleep and forgot to turn off their computers, or maybe we made some sense today and helped some people. I guess I would just want to add one thing, Alan, because I think you said there are some small, there are some business owners on this call. You know, you brought up privilege, and so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think as a CPA advisor, if I had a client saying, I think maybe I need to file bankruptcy, first of all, I always advise clients, call the bankruptcy attorney sooner rather than later. Just because you speak to them does not mean that you're going to file bankruptcy. They may be able to help you not file bankruptcy, but I would also encourage them to be fully honest with you know, not try to hide things from their bankruptcy attorney because that person is here to help you. And if you have warts, this is not the time to hide them because they're going to come out anyway. And so tell the attorney so that the attorney can help control the damage to you. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And then the other thing is maybe hire the attorney just to be your personal attorney and not the corporate mm -hmm. attorney. When the corporation goes into bankruptcy, you may lose your attorney client privilege. Okay. The, bankruptcy. So I guess that's another thing right. to make sure we, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Ken and Chris? It, the only thing I'd say is uh, in the context of three weeks from now, if there are topics we didn't cover or you think we should have covered in more depth, please chuck it in the chat so that uh, we can kind of revisit our, our slide deck here and make sure we're covering things that people deemed relevant. Yep. And we have we have been invited to give this panel discussion for for others, but we're going to do this AICPA thing first, and then if you're interested in in having Chris or I mean Ken Elizabeth or Chris, you know, speak on a webinar for your organization or anything like that, just just reach out. We'll be you know glad to make that happen for you. 
So I hope everybody has a fantastic rest of Saturday, a great Sunday. I hope that we all dodge the hurricane successfully here in Florida at least. And uh, thanks again for, for joining them. Alan, thanks for hosting. Thanks everybody. Yeah.